Chapter forty five of Esther Waters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Esther Waters by George Moore. Chapter forty five. She stood on the platform watching the receding train. A few bushes hid the curve of the line, the white vapour rose above them, evaporating in the grey evening. A moment more and the last carriage would pass out of sight. The white gate swung slowly forward and closed over the line. An oblong box painted reddish-brown lay on the seat beside her, a woman of seven or eight-and-thirty, stout and strongly built, short arms and hard-worked hands dressed in dingy black skirt and a threadbare jacket too thin for the dampness of a november day her face was a blunt outline and the grey eyes reflected all the natural prose of the saxon the porter told her that he would try to send her box up to woodview to-morrow that was the way to woodview right up the lane she could not miss it she would find the lodge gate behind that clump of trees and thinking how she could get her box to woodview that evening she looked at the barren strip of country lying between the downs and the shingle beach the little town clamped about its deserted harbour seemed more than ever like falling to pieces like a derelict vessel and when esther passed over the level crossing she noticed that the line of little villas had not increased they were as she had left them eighteen years ago laurels iron railing antimacassars it was about eighteen years ago on a beautiful june day that she had passed up this lane for the first time at the very spot she was now passing she had stopped to wonder if she would be able to keep the place of kitchen-maid she remembered regretting that she had not a new dress she had hoped to be able to brighten up the best of her cotton prints with a bit of red ribbon the sun was shining and she had met william leaning over the paling in the avenue smoking his pipe eighteen years had gone by eighteen years of labour suffering disappointment a great deal had happened so much that she could not remember it all the situations she had been in her life with that dear good soul miss rice then fred parsons then william again her marriage the life in the public-house money lost and money won heart-breakings death everything that could happen had happened to her now it all seemed like a dream but her boy remained to her she had brought up her boy thank god she had been able to do that but how had she done it how often had she found herself within sight of the workhouse the last time was no later than last week last week it had seemed to her that she would have to accept the workhouse but she had escaped and now here she was back at the very point from which she started going back to woodview going back to mrs barfield's service William's illness and his funeral had taken Esther's last few pounds away from her, and when she and Jack came back from the cemetery, she found that she had broken into her last sovereign. She clasped him to her bosom. He was a tall boy of fifteen, and burst into tears. But she did not tell him what she was crying for. She did not say, God only knows how we shall find bread to eat next week she merely said wiping away her tears we can't afford to live here any longer it's too expensive for us now that father's gone and they went to live in a slum for three and sixpence a week if she had been alone in the world she would have gone into a situation but she could not leave the boy and so she had to look out for charing it was hard to have to come down to this particularly when she remembered that she had a house and a servant of her own but there was nothing for it but to look out for some sharing and get along as best she could 
until Jack was able to look after himself. But the various scrubbings and general cleaning that had come her way had been so badly paid that she soon found that she could not make both ends meet. She would have to leave her boy and go out as a general servant, and as her necessities were pressing, she accepted a situation in a coffee-shop in the London Road. She would give all her wages to Jack, seven shillings a week, and he would have to live on that. So long as she had her health, she did not mind. It was a squat brick building with four windows that looked down on the pavement with a short-sighted stare. On each window was written in letters of white enamel, well-aired beds. A board nailed to a post by the side door announced that tea and coffee were always ready. On the other side of the sign was an upholsterer's, and the vulgar brightness of the Brussels carpets seemed in keeping with the slop-like appearance of the coffee-house. Sometimes a workman came in the morning. A couple more might come in about dinner-time. Sometimes they took rashers and bits of steak out of their pockets. "'Won't you cook this for me, missus?' But it was not until about nine in the evening that the real business of the house began, and it continued till one, when the last straggler knocked for admittance. The house lived on its beds. The best rooms were sometimes let for eight shillings a night, and there were four beds which were let at fourpence a night in the cellar, under the area where Esther stood, by the great copper washing sheets, blankets, and counterpanes when she was not cleaning the rooms upstairs. There was a double-bedded room underneath the kitchen, and over the landings, wherever a space could be found. The landlord, who was clever at carpentering work, had fitted up some sort of closet place that could be let as a bedroom. The house was a honeycomb. The landlord slept under the roof, and a corner had been found for his housekeeper, a handsome young woman at the end of the passage. Esther and the children, the landlord was a widower, slept in the coffee-room upon planks laid across the tops of the high backs of the benches where the customers mealed. Mattresses and bedding were laid on these planks, and the sleepers lay, their faces hardly two feet from the ceiling. Esther slept with a baby, a little boy of five. The two big boys slept at the other end of the room by the front door. The eldest was about fifteen, but he was only half-witted, and he helped in the housework, and could turn down the beds and see quicker than any one if the occupant had stolen sheet or blanket. Esther always remembered how he would raise himself up in bed in the early morning, rub the glass, and light a candle, so that he could be seen from below. He shook his head if every bed was occupied or signed with his fingers the prices of the beds if they had any to let. The landlord was a tall, thin man, with long features and hair turning grey. He was very quiet, and Esther was surprised one night at the abruptness with which he stopped a couple who were going upstairs. "'Is that your wife?' he said. "'Yes, she's my wife, all right.' "'She don't look very old.' She's older than she looks. Then he said half to Esther, half to his housekeeper, that it was hard to know what to do. If you ask them for their marriage certificates, they'd be sure to show you something. The housekeeper answered that they paid well, and that was the principal thing. But when an attempt was made to steal the bedclothes, the landlord and his housekeeper were more severe. As Esther was about to let a most respectable woman out of the front door, the idiot boy called down the stairs. Stop her! There's a sheet missing. Oh, what in the world is all this? I haven't got your sheet. Pray let me pass. I'm in a hurry. I can't let you pass until the sheet is found. You'll find it upstairs under the bed. It's got mislaid. I'm in a hurry. "'Call in the police!' shouted the idiot boy. "'You'd better come upstairs and help me to find the sheet,' said Esther. The woman hesitated a moment, and then walked up in front of Esther. When they were in the bedroom, she shook out her petticoats, and the sheet fell on the floor. "'There now,' said Esther, 
A nice botheration you'd have got me into. I should have had to pay for it. Oh, I could pay for it. It was only because I'm not very well off at present. Yes, you will pay for it if you don't take care, said Esther. It was very soon after that Esther had her mother's books stolen from her. They had not been doing much business, and she had been put to sleep in one of the bedrooms. The room was suddenly wanted, and she had no time to move all her things, and when she went to make up the room, she found that her mother's books and a pair of jet earrings that Fred had given her had been stolen. She could do nothing. The couple who had occupied the rooms were far away by this time. There was no hope of ever recovering her books and earrings, and the loss of these things caused her a great deal of unhappiness. The only little treasure she possessed were those earrings. Now they were gone. She realized how utterly alone she was in the world. If her health were to break down tomorrow, she would have to go to the workhouse. What would become of her boy? She was afraid to think. Thinking did no good. She must not think, but must just work on, washing the bedclothes until she could wash no longer, wash, wash all the week long, and it was only by working on till one o'clock in the morning that she sometimes managed to get the Sabbath free from washing. Never, not even in the house in Chelsea, had she had such hard work, and she was not as strong now as she was then but her courage did not give way until one Sunday Jack came to tell her that the people who had employed him had sold their business. Then a strange weakness came over her. She thought of the endless week of work that awaited her in the cellar, the great copper on the fire, the heaps of soiled linen in the corner, the steam rising from the wash-tub, and she felt she had not sufficient strength to get through another week of such work. She looked at her son with despair in her eyes. She had whispered to him as he lay asleep under her shawl, a tiny infant, There is nothing for us, my poor boy, but the workhouse. And the same thought rose up in her mind as she looked at him, a tall lad with large grey eyes and dark curling hair but she did not trouble him with her despair. She merely said, I don't know how we shall pull through, Jack. God will help us. You're washing too hard, mother. You're wasting away. Do you know no one, mother, who could help us? She looked at Jack fixedly, and she thought of Mrs. Barfield. Mrs. Barfield might be away in the south with her daughter. If she were at Woodview, Esther felt sure she would not refuse to help her. So Jack wrote at Esther's dictation, and before they expected an answer, a letter came from Mrs. Barfield, saying that she remembered Esther perfectly well. She had just returned from the south. She was all alone at Woodview, and wanted a servant. Esther could come and take the place if she liked. She enclosed five pounds, and hoped that the money would enable Esther to leave London at once. But this returning to former conditions filled Esther with strange trouble. Her heart beat as she recognized the spire of the church between the trees, and the undulating lines of downs behind the trees awakened painful recollections. She knew the white gate was somewhere in this plantation, but could not remember its exact position, and she took the road to the left instead of taking the road to the right, and had to retrace her steps. The gate had fallen from its hinge, and she had some difficulty in opening it. The lodge, where the blind gatekeeper used to play the flute, was closed. The park polling had not been kept in repair. Wandering sheep and cattle had worn away the great holly hedge, and Esther noticed that in falling an elm had broken through the garden wall. When she arrived at the iron gate under the bunched evergreens, her steps paused, for this was where she had met William for the first time. He had taken her through the stables and pointed out to her silver braids box. 
she remembered the horses going to the downs, horses coming from the downs, stabling and the sound of hoofs everywhere. But now silence. She could see that many a roof had fallen, and that ruins of outhouses filled the yard. She remembered the kitchen windows, bright in the setting sun, and the white-capped servants moving about the great white table. But now the shutters were up, nowhere a light. The knocker had disappeared from the door, and she asked herself how she was to get in. She even felt afraid. Supposing she should not find Mrs. Barfield? She made her way through the shrubbery, tripping over fallen branches and trunks of trees. Rooks rose out of the evergreens with a great clatter. Her heart stood still, and she hardly dared to tear herself through the mass of underwood. At last she gained the lawn, and, still very frightened, sought for the bell. The socket plate hung loose on the wire, and only a faint tinkle came through the solitude of the empty house. At last footsteps and a light. The chain door was opened a little, and a voice asked who it was. Esther explained. The door was opened, and she stood face to face with her old mistress. Mrs. Barfield stood holding the candle high, so that she could see Esther. Esther knew her at once. She had not changed very much. She kept her beautiful white teeth and her girlish smile. The pointed, vixen-like face had not altered in outline, but the reddish hair was so thin that it had to be parted on the side and drawn over the skull. Her figure was delicate and sprightly as ever. Esther noticed all this, and Mrs. Barfield noticed that Esther had grown stouter. Her face was still pleasant to see, for it kept that look of blunt, honest nature which had always been its charm. She was now the thick-set working woman of forty, and she stood holding the hem of her jacket in her rough hands. "'We'd better put the chain up, for I'm alone in the house.' "'Aren't you afraid, ma'am?' "'A little, but there's nothing to steal.' I asked the policeman to keep a lookout. Come into the library. There was the round table, the little green sofa, the piano, the parrot's cage, and the yellow-painted presses, and it seemed only a little while since she had been summoned to this room, since she had stood facing her mistress, her confession on her lips. It seemed like yesterday, and yet seventeen years and more had gone by and all these years were now a sort of blur in her mind, a dream, the connecting links of which were gone, and she stood face to face with her old mistress in the old room. "'You've had a cold journey, Esther. You'd like some tea?' "'Oh, don't trouble, ma'am.' "'It's no trouble. I should like some myself. The fire's out in the kitchen.' We can boil the kettle here. They went through the base door into the long passage. Mrs. Barfield told Esther where was the pantry, the kitchen and the larder. Esther answered that she remembered quite well, and it seemed to her not a little strange that she should know these things. Mrs. Barfield said, So you haven't forgotten, would you, Esther? No, ma'am. It seems like yesterday, but I'm afraid the damp has got into the kitchen, ma'am. The range is that neglected. Ah, Woodview isn't what it was. Mrs. Barfield told how she had buried her husband in the old village church. She had taken her daughter to Egypt. She had dwindled there till there was little more than a skeleton to lay in the grave. Yes, ma'am. I know how it takes them, inch by inch. My husband died of consumption. They sat talking for hours. One thing led to another, and Esther gradually told Mrs. Barfield the story of her life from the day they bade each other good-bye in the room they were now sitting. It's quite a romance, Esther. It was a hard fight, and it isn't over yet, ma'am. 
it won't be over until i see him settled in some regular work i hope i shall live to see him settled they sat over the fire a long time without speaking mrs barfield said it must be getting on for bedtime i suppose it must ma'am she asked if she should sleep in the room she had once shared with margaret gale mrs barfield answered with a sigh that as all the bedrooms were empty esther had better sleep in the room next to hers end of chapter forty five read by lars rolander